This morning we are going to conclude the Olivet Discourse in Mark chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 28 through 37, which will be displayed on the screen behind me, but of course feel free to follow along in your Bibles if that's what you choose to do. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 28. And again, let's, um, if you've been here for the rest of the series, let's try to understand this in the context of AD 70. Uh, or if you don't agree with me on that position, you'll need to understand it in whatever context, but at least try to see it from that perspective, and I think you'll see that it does make perfect sense. Now, verse 28. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep what I say to you I say to all be on the alert may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning now again just by way of quick review we we have seen what it is that Jesus is addressing in this chapter the question that the disciples asked regarding the destruction of the temple. Uh, we've also seen who it is that he's addressing, or whom it is, or no, who it is. And that is his disciples. He's speaking to them. Uh, we've seen the things that he has told them that will actually precede the destruction of the temple. He said there would be false Christs, and wars, earthquakes, famines and that they would preach the gospel throughout the entire world or as we saw the Roman Empire. We've seen the signal that he gave them that the time had actually arrived, which is the abomination of desolation. Jerusalem surrounded on all sides by her enemies, in this case, the Roman armies, and what it was they were to do when they saw uh, Jerusalem about to become desolate, they were to get out of there they were to run to the mountains, get out of Judea because of the judgment that was falling on Jerusalem. And we've also seen what would happen immediately following the tribulation of those days. Jerusalem would fall. Those who pierced him, especially the leaders, would see that judgment and they would know that it was Jesus Christ who brought it. And Finally, the Lord would begin the evangelization of the entire world to gather in his elect, to build up his New Testament church, since the Old Testament church was being uh, judged, uh, which is made up, of course, primarily Jews and Gentiles, but I believe in this particular phase, primarily Gentiles. Now, this morning, we're going to finish this section by looking at the last two things that Jesus tells them in connection with this event. Basically, these two things. The first having to do, again, with the time frame in which these things would happen. And the second with the warning, then, to be on the alert. So first of all, let's consider the time frame in which these things would take place. Jesus tells them that it would happen in their lifetime. Now, first of all, he points to the fig tree. And he says, by looking at the fig tree, you can know when summer is drawing near. The fig tree puts forth its leaves. 
they become tender, as it were, the branches become tender, and when the leaves begin to come out, you know that it's time for summer. He says, in the same way, when they see the signs that he had pointed to, that they were to know that his coming is near. As a matter of fact, right at the door. Now, I do believe, of course, that the fig tree, as I've already mentioned, is often explained today as being a figure of Israel. And the, uh, the putting forth of the leaves of the fruit on the fig tree is the, the rebirth of Israel as a nation. And then what follows after that, that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, is understood in one of two ways. Either this race of people or the generation that sees this rebirth of Israel will not pass away until all these things take place. But I want you to understand Jesus is using the image of the fig tree just as an image of a fig tree. He says, when you see this happening, you know that summer is near. It's, this is a natural occurrence. This is the way God has made things. You can tell the seasons by what happens to the, you know, the plants and various other things. Well, in the same way, you can know the seasons of his judgment when you see these things coming about. You can know that he is near right at the door. Now, again, I pointed out on several occasions, the things that Jesus is speaking about here were going to affect them. Jesus knew they were going to affect them, which is why he is, keeps warning them and telling them. But again, I think the, the most um, sure proof of this is what he says in verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, which generation? The one that would see the reflowering or the rebirth of Israel as a nation uh, almost 2,000 years in the future? Jesus didn't have that in his mind at all. But the generation that would see the signs that he was pointing to would not die off. The generation that they were a part of would not die off until all these things took place. Now again, I, um, we, we do need to realize, and I think we do need to take seriously the, perhaps the objection that some raise, and, and that is, I've already told you, uh, I've already answered the one objection about the fig tree in the future, that being Israel. I don't think that's the case at all. But the other objection has to do with understanding the word generation differently. Because, again, there are so many who want to put these events into the future when Jesus is really speaking about the past. In order to do that, they have to understand the word generation differently. Now, here's just a, a minor lesson in um, exegesis, you might say, or at least interpreting scripture. I think you understand that in the English language, as well as in the Greek language or any other language, uh, every word, virtually every word, has a range of meaning. It, it's hardly the case that a word can only have one meaning. Let me give you an example. In our language, for instance, the word green. You know, what does it mean? If I were to ask you, what does the word green mean? Well, you would have to see it in its context to understand it. Because sometimes it means the color green. Sometimes it means that it, it's referring to the fact that somebody is a novice. Sometimes it's talking about money, you know, give me some of that green. Or sometimes it means I'm envious, you know, I'm, I'm green with envy. You see, the word green can mean a number of different things. Well, the same thing is true of the word that is translated here, generation, okay? The word generation could also mean race. And as a matter of fact, it's even used one time in the New Testament to mean race. And those who believe that, that that's what it means here, they, what they believe Jesus is saying, is that the Jews will not cease to be a distinct race of people until all these things come to pass. And the fact that the Jews are still Jews today and they haven't just sort of disappeared like some you know, uh, groups of people have, and I really shouldn't use the word race because they're not, would be a race of people, uh, but perhaps a, an ethnic group or something like that. Uh, the fact that they still exist today means that these things are still future. But again, I would ask you to look at the context and try to determine whether this is really what Jesus is saying. Now, granted that the word can mean race, and it is used once in the New Testament to mean that, by far the majority use of this word is generation. And that word means 
those who are alive at that time. We talk about our parents' generation. We talk about you know, the, the people who lived at the time that, that they lived or the people who grew up with them. That's their generation. Our generation is the one we grew up in, the people who are living at the same time we are, and so forth in future generations. Now, throughout his ministry, Jesus has gone out of his way to point out the wickedness of that particular generation. And he warned again and again the judgment was going to fall upon them, which means it's not surprising we should find that reference here in this passage where he's warning them. Now, let me give you a few examples, especially in the book of Matthew. Matthew 12, verse 39. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, who was he referring to? Or whom is he referring to? That generation that was living then, those Jews he was speaking to. Now, let's look at another example, Matthew chapter 12, verses 41 through 45. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, pay attention to this part. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Now again, notice what Jesus is saying. He's not charging the Jews in general throughout all their generations. He's saying those Jews that are alive then were particularly wicked and they were going to be condemned on the day of judgment. The reason being is because of his ministry among them. He's virtually like the one who goes and casts the demon out of a, out of a demon possessed person. He virtually ex excluded as it were sickness and demon possession in Israel during the time of his ministry, but because they did not receive him. You know, the spirits go out in waterless places and they come back and they find their house swept and kept in order and everything is there, but it's unoccupied because they didn't receive Jesus Christ. And so then they take more evil spirits, as it were, and they go in and occupy that space, and the last state is worse than the first. Israel was worse off after Jesus had come than they were before he came because they now had all this light and all this evidence, and they rejected it. They rejected Jesus Christ, so judgment was falling on them. Jesus is singling out that generation for judgment. Chapter 17, verse 17, and Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? And then the death knell, of course, in Matthew 23, verses 34 through 36, which again is not in Mark, but it is in Matthew's gospel. Just before the Olivet Discourse, these are the concluding uh, verses of the previous chapter. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Which generation is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the people who were living at that time because they were the ones who were the evil ones and the ones who rejected him and the ones who killed him and crucified him, the ones who also 
mistreated, killed, and even crucified some of his servants whom he sent to them. The judgment was falling on them, and that's why we should take our Lord's words in verse 30, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. He's telling them that they would live to see God's judgment against Jerusalem because this was God's judgment against the generation that rejected and crucified the Messiah. Now, how certain could they be that these things were actually going to happen, that the words of Jesus were going to take place, that this was going to happen in their lifetime? Jesus tells them in no uncertain words, with absolute certainty, that this was going to come to pass. Verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Basically, Jesus says it would be easier for the creation to cease to exist than for the words that I have just spoken to fall to the ground. This is going to happen. Now that's where we move into the next section. Since these things were actually going to take place in their lifetime, but they didn't know exactly when they were going to take place, Jesus tells them that they need to be ready at all times for it. Now when were these things going to take place? Jesus had told them what to look for. You know, he gave them the signs and the seasons. But he did not tell them the exact time of this event, the exact day and year and so forth. Now, why didn't Jesus tell them? Well, it's because Jesus didn't know. Look at verse 32. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, why is it that Jesus didn't know this? Now, we don't have much time to explore this. This is a rather large area of, of theology, but let me just simply say this. The fact that, that Jesus Christ in his humanity did not know does not mean that he isn't God. He is fully God. But it points out to us the fact that Jesus also is fully man. And that when he became one with us, he actually took our limitations upon himself. In a certain sense, you might say he took upon himself a certain degree of ignorance. Did the man Christ Jesus know everything that there was to know? Did he have infinite knowledge? Well, if that's the case, uh, what does the scripture mean when it says that he grew in, in stature and wisdom and in favor with God and man? The fact is, Jesus Christ as a man learned certain things because he did not know everything. The fact that he knew certain things that only God could know in his humanity was because the Holy Spirit was communicating those things to him during his lifetime, even as the Spirit might communicate these things to a prophet, uh, telling him things that he wouldn't have known otherwise. So yes, Jesus Christ was ignorant of certain things in his human nature, but in his divine nature, he was not ignorant of anything. And again, if this causes you problems, just remember that the man Christ Jesus could die. He died on the cross. God can't die. Uh, the man Christ Jesus became weary. Uh, God can't become weary, but as a man, he can become weary. Whatever is true of a human nature, accepting sin, of course, was true of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as we don't know everything, he did not either because he was fully man. But here's the point. Because he didn't know the day or the hour, he couldn't tell them the day or the hour, so he told them to be on the alert, to be ready. Verse 33, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Now, how is it that they were to get ready? By working and by waiting or keeping watch. Again, verses 34 through 37, it's like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. 
Now, they were supposed to be about the particular task that Jesus Christ had given to them. Before AD 70 was to come, uh, they were tasked with evangelizing uh, the Roman Empire. They were supposed to go to the Jew first to tell them about the fulfillment of the promises to the Jews, and when the Jews rejected it, to turn to the Gentiles. But all the while, when they see, of course, the signs beginning to come, they were to be on the alert for these things because those things would signal that his coming is near. Now, you know, it was last Lord's Day evening we were looking at an interesting point of um, understanding the Bible. We were talking about the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ, the belief that he could come at, at any time at all. Even from the time he ascended into heaven, he could have come back right away, and, and they needed to be ready for it. But I want you to notice here that Jesus was actually telling his disciples that his coming was not eminent yet, that he gave them a task to do. As a matter of fact, Acts chapter 1, you know, you are to be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, if, if that's what Jesus tasked them to do, how could they expect him to return right away? His coming couldn't have been imminent in that sense, okay? It wasn't imminent. It wasn't right about to happen. It wasn't at the door until they saw the signs that Jesus was pointing to. When you see these things happening, verse 29, recognize that he is near right at the door. So in other words, again, the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the fact that he could have come at any time, can't be true even then. It couldn't have been true until they saw the signs coming to pass that Jesus had warned them about. That was the signal. The judgment was near. Now let me just conclude this by saying this. Remember that these were the signs of judgment against Jerusalem for their rejection of the Messiah. It was that generation that was the wicked and perverse generation that had rejected him and crucified him. It was that generation upon which all the righteous bloodshed on earth was going to fall. Jesus was warning them because it was going to come during their lifetime. And we've already seen that everything took place exactly as Jesus said it was going to come about. So that event is past, already done. We don't need to be on the alert looking for those signs that Jesus gave to them because those were signs of his judgment upon Jerusalem. We don't need to be on the alert as they needed to be on the alert once they saw the signs because, again, those signs are not for us. They were for them. Now, let me just mention this, too. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to raise the dead and to bring all the living to judgment, that is still future, and we need to be ready for that. Now, that may, that may come, as some believe it may come any time from our perspective. There's others that believe that it may be a little ways off, but either way, we do need to be ready. Now, we're going to look at the second coming, perhaps in one or two sermons in the evening service beginning next week since we have Dr. Kramadam coming uh, this week. But that event is still future. This coming of Christ in 70 AD was not his second coming. This was his coming in judgment against Jerusalem. So in closing, let me remind you of this, that there is a second coming. There is a judgment, as we saw in Matthew chapter 25, and we need to be ready for it. The only time in which we have to get ready for it is this lifetime. Uh, the number of years that we have in this world, that's it. The Bible reminds us again and again that this life is very short. James 4.14, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Have you ever seen how the steam comes out of a kettle when you're heating it, how the vapor comes out, but it's there just for a brief moment it's gone? That's what James says, your life and my life are like a brief vapor. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 24, all flesh is like grass, and it's all its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. That is what you and I are like. Now, those of you who are 
middle-aged like me, I guess I might even be a senior citizen now, um, you know how brief life is. I look at my kids and I think, you know, it, was, it seems like just a couple of weeks ago I was in their shoes. I was going through what they're going through and uh, that I was, you know, much younger. Life is short. And the longer I live, the more I see that what the Word of God says is true. Now, even if you should live to be 110, which is kind of the outer limits as far as how long people can live today, and that's pretty rare. Uh, a lot of people die in their 70s. I mean, some people don't live even to get nearly that old. Many in their 80s. Not very many people make it into their 90s, and certainly fewer make it through their 90s into their 100s. Very, very few. That's such a brief period of time compared to the endless stretches of time ahead of us, and yet that is the only time that we have to get ready to meet the Lord. It's the only time that we have to get ready for that judgment. It's the only time that we have to get ready for death. So what can we do to get ready for the event that is still ahead of us? You know, we don't have to worry about this event that we've just been looking at. But we do have to take into account that just as the Lord said these things were going to take place, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The same thing is true of what he's telling us with regard to the judgment and the second coming. It is going to take place. So what can you do to get ready for it? Basically, the only thing you can do is the same thing Jesus told his disciples to do to get ready for his coming in, in, in judgment in 70 AD. And that is you need to work and you need to wait. Now, of course, the first thing you need to do is if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you need to trust him to save you from your sins because he is the only one who can. You cannot work your way to heaven. You can't make yourself good enough in God's eyes. Your works are like filthy rags to him. In other words, uh, they're repulsive because they're filled with sin. Only the works of Jesus Christ are acceptable to God. That's why you need to trust Jesus to save you, to make you righteous, to trust in his sacrifice on the cross to take away your sins and to trust in his perfect obedience to make you right with God, to make you acceptable. You need to trust him. But having trusted him, you do need to turn from your sins. That is the evidence that you are saved by the Lord, that he's granted you his grace. You need to stop doing the things he tells you not to do, and you need to begin doing the things he calls you to do. That's basically your duty, to obey the will of God. No longer seeing your life as belonging to yourself, but rather seeing it as belonging to God. Now, Jesus had told his disciples what he wanted them to do while they were waiting. Well, he's told you what he wants you to do, too. And he's told you at least how to do what you do for his glory and his word. As far as what you're going to do with your life, it depends on your gifts and graces and the opportunities that God gives to you and the education that he gives you the opportunity to get. He's going to open doors for you, but whatever he has called you to do, you need to do it for his glory. You need to do it trying to advance his kingdom in the things that you do. Sometimes I think we think, and especially when we're, we're just growing up and we're becoming adults and uh, it's beginning, it hasn't really dawned on us yet that life is really a good deal of work and it's not maybe what we thought it was earlier, just kind of like fun all the way through. God has not put us into this world just to have fun. Sometimes we might like to think that. Sometimes we might like to focus on that. But that's not why he put us here. He put us here to work for him. The Lord did not put us into this world to seek for our own fame and our own fortune. The Lord actually put us into this world to seek for his glory, to bring honor to him and to advance his kingdom and not our kingdom. That's why the Lord saved us. That's why he put us into this world. And that's the only way that we can, well, we can, of course, amass uh, treasures in heaven. But the only way that we can be ready for the Lord, whether he comes for us at death or whether the second coming comes in our lifetime, is to be being about what it is that God has actually made us to do and doing those things for his glory at the same time waiting and watching for those indications that the scripture has given us that his coming is near for us. Now, sometimes the indications are relatively few and maybe not even existent. I mean, 
Some people die suddenly and they don't even know it's coming. Other people have a little bit of time to get ready as they see the signs of their death approaching, but that doesn't happen for everyone. So when should you start getting ready? You need to be ready now. You need to trust Jesus now. You need to be busily doing what he calls you to do so that when he comes for you, you're ready. Again, don't look for the second coming. Don't bank on the fact you've got years and years and years ahead of you. You need to be ready at all times to meet the Lord. That's what the Lord calls you to do. So, again, to be ready for, for the coming of the Lord for you, you need to be doing what the apostles were doing, what Jesus called them to do. He assigned each their task, and he told them to be on the watch. That's what you need to do. In closing, let me just read these words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, because I think it summarizes what the Lord would have you to do to get ready. He says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and again, that assumes that you've trusted him and you're turning from your sins, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Do you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord? This is what you need to do. Stop living for this world. Live for the world to come. Be getting, you know, spend your time getting ready for that judgment that you know is going to come. Heaven and earth, Jesus says, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It is coming. The Lord will help you get ready for it. But you do need to seek Him. You do need to trust Him. You do need to turn from your sins. You do need to be busily about what He has called you to do. If you do, you will be ready. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard, which are very sobering truths, and to apply them in a way to us that will help us to see their reality and to live as we should in the light of them. Let's pray.